Economics 1. Unit 1, The Capitalist Revolution. This series of mini-lecture videos on the capitalist revolution follows closely core The Economy, Unit 1. Across the three mini-lecture videos, parts 1, 2 and 3 for this unit, the intended learning outcomes are that you will have a clear understanding and capability of explaining 1 the concepts of economic divergence and of economic inequalities, that's in part one of these three mini lecture videos. Two, the concept of economic inequality over time across countries and within countries. Three, key factors associated with technological revolution and economic growth over time. Four, the role of capitalism in the technological revolution. And five, the importance of government in capitalist economies. We're going to be covering a range of issues, and here's a very brief summary of some of those, and of the narrative running through them, as we study capitalism and think about the study of economics as a social science discipline. 1. Since the 1700s, there have been huge increases in average living standards, and those have become sustained. 2. At the same time, the capitalist economic system was emerging. 3. Capitalism was associated with private property and production and distribution through firms and markets. 4. Advances in technology and specialisation raised the output potential of economies. 5. These industrial and technological revolutions have produced growing threats to the national environment and unprecedented global economic inequalities even at the same time as they have increased average living standards in a sustained way. And six, economics is a social science, which that is how people and organisations interact with each other and with the natural environment in producing their livelihoods. And Unit 1 will be studying and looking in detail at all of these issues. So let's start by looking at this figure. This figure shows gross domestic product per capita along the vertical axis. We'll also explain how the measurement of this GDP per capita is in terms of US dollars in 1990 on the basis of purchasing power parity, and all this will be explained. Along the horizontal axis, we're looking at time in years from the year 1000 all the way up to the current time. What you can most obviously see from this graph, which we'll explain in more detail as we proceed, is the, the broad constancy of GDP per capita from the year 1000 and although we don't have the chart going back before that the same would be true for many years prior to that as well this broad constancy running at about a level of below a thousand or towards 2000 in in some economies in some societies almost entirely constant until we get to around 1650 1700 it, things are necessarily a little bit vague we can't be too precise in just when Things started, the data are not so reliable going that far back. It's a Herculean task to have produced these data over such a long period of time. But what we see then is this rapid increase, almost exponential growth, um, from that period of around 1700 up to the current time. We're looking at this for a range of countries. The, the blue line is looking at Britain, and then we have Japan, Italy, China and India in the other colour codes. And you see that although the takeoff period was different, pretty much for all of these economies, we're seeing this rapid growth kicking in at a certain point of time, at different rates and at different points with the different economies. Let's define some of these concepts that we've been men mentioning. So broadly, we can think of gross domestic product, or GDP for short, as being a measure of total income and output produced in an economy in a given period of time, normally one year. We usually express this in terms of a per capita basis. So that's the gross domestic product for a whole economy or society divided by the number of people in that society um, to get a per capita basis. And that gives us a measure of GDP as an average per person. And we regard it as a rather imperfect measure, but nonetheless one of the few measures that we have um, of well-being of people um, at any particular time in any particular society. The idea of 
measuring this in US dollars on a purchasing power parity basis is simply to give us a common unit of measurement to ensure a like-for-like -like comparison across countries and over time. It avoids problems, for example, associated with different fluctuations over time in price levels or in exchange rates between, between economies. So really the picture emerging there is one that we're going to want to try to understand more clearly as we proceed through this unit. And what's sometimes been used as a term to describe the shape of this set of profiles in GDP per capita growth over time across countries is that it's a hockey stick-like growth. If you think about uh, an ice hockey stick or perhaps a, a standard grass hockey stick, then we see that, that blade being very flat for a long time and then the handle shooting upwards. So for a thousand years ago, the world was, could, be think, could be thought of as being flat in the sense that there just was not sustained growth. There might have been small perturbations or fluctuations um, it, from one year to the next or one ten-year cycle to the next, but broadly there was consistency. There was no sustained long-term growth. Then things changed around 1700, and the, one of the key questions we'll be asking is, why did that change occur? What was it that changed exactly around 1700 to produce this hockey stick growth-like picture? Today there are large differences, both within and especially across countries, and we'll be asking, why is that? Indeed, a thousand years ago, differences in average GDP per capita were relatively small. So we might be looking at, for example, if you, if you chart the green line for Italy and the line for China, you see that GDP per capita was, was around about 2,000, whilst for the other countries in this list, the level was, was lower at about perhaps 1,000. So there were differences. You could say that China and Italy were approximately twice as well off um, as Britain in terms of GDP per capita. But in the, in the current time, those differences uh, are much greater. We, we see, uh, as, we, as we will go on to see over the coming uh, slides, the differences between countries have grown considerably compared to a thousand years ago. So that by 2020, differences across countries are much greater. Just from, from these, this small set of countries, you can see that GDP per capita in Britain was about six times that of India and twice that of China and by, the, by the year 2000 and so. Let's now think about economic inequality. We're going to consider this within countries, across countries and over time. The two figures that you can see on this slide uh, measure essentially the same thing but for two different time periods. The upper panel has 1980 and the lower panel has a more recent period, 34 years later, of 2014. So five to six years ago or so. Let's look at the top figure to begin with. So the vertical axis is measuring something very similar to what we were looking at in the previous slides, which is annual income in countries, measured in terms of GDP per capita, and we're using a constant price basis, of US dollars in purchasing power parity, but this time it's for the year 2005. And there are some notable features that we're going to pull out of these two figures. So let's start by thinking, for example, about Singapore. It's not one of the countries labelled in the figures, but if we were thinking about where it which space it occupied in this figure, we would see that Singapore is one of the very richest countries on the furthest right of these figures. And the average income in Singapore for the richest and the poorest, 10% of people in Singapore are 67,000 US dollars and 3,600, so just less than 4,000 US dollars respectively. For the richest and for the poorest, 10% in Singapore at one point in time. Whereas in Liberia, which is the poorest country, towards one of the very poorest countries, the furthest left of, the, left of these figures, the corresponding figures are less than $1,000 and 
for the richest 10% and a very minute level of $17 per person among the lowest 10%. So huge differences both between Singapore and Liberia in terms of the average living standards of those in the richest 10% and those in the poorest 10%. So if we think about the ratio between the richest 10% of people and the poorest 10% of people, which is what we sometimes call the 90-10 ratio, 90 measuring the average income of those who are at the 90th percentile and above in the income distribution versus those who are in the, in the bottom decile, bottom 10% um, and below, that 90-10 ratio in Singapore is 18.5 and in Liberia it's 58.5. So the top, the richest 10% are 18.5 times better off in Singapore than are the poorest 10% in Singapore. So that's a very large difference, but nothing to the equivalent figure in Liberia, which tells us that the richest 10% in Liberia are 58.5 times better off than the poorest 10% in Liberia. So huge differences within countries in Singapore and in Liberia, respectively, but the difference between countries in the extent of inequality is also huge. Inequality across countries, however, exceeds that within countries. For example, if we look at the ratio of GDP per capita in Singapore to Liberia, and what we're now doing is we're comparing the top 10% in Singapore with the top 10% in Liberia. On the previous slide, we were looking within a country at the top 10% against the bottom 10%. Now we're just looking across countries among the top 10%. And we're saying that, based on the figures we saw a couple of slides ago, the top 10% in Singapore are almost 70 times better off than the top 10% in Liberia. And if we look among the bottom 10% in each of these two countries, we find that the bottom 10% in Singapore are 215 times better off than are the bottom 10% in Liberia. We can make these comparisons because we're looking at this common base of US dollars measured in 2005 on a purchasing power parity basis. So we can make these meaningful comparisons across countries and within countries and indeed we can do that over time. So the conclusion from this couple of slides in terms of economic inequality is that whilst there is huge inequality within countries, the inequality across countries exceeds that. This is in large part explained by differences across countries in when sustained technological changes started. Countries that took off economically a century or more ago, such as the UK, Japan, Italy, are now much richer than those that took off only recently, or which haven't yet taken off at all. And if we look at the movement of different countries in the ranking over time, we see huge changes. Let's consider in particular the case of China, for example. So if you look at the top figure, China is, which is only 40 years ago or so, China fe features among the very poorest countries in this list, with very low annual income per capita. By 2014, China has moved from being among the very poorest countries to being in the upper part of the distribution across countries, having overtaken a number of countries, including India, Indonesia, Botswana and Brazil. And there we see in the figure how China has changed position within that distribution across countries. What you also see is huge inequality beginning to take off in countries partly as they move up that income distribution. And if you look at China, things look relatively flat in 1980 in, uh, within China. But by 2014, if you look at China itself, the, the broad red line, the breadth representing population size, you see that at the far end of that broadband representing China, there's quite a mountainous cliff which represents inequality in China in that latter period with the top percentiles receiving very high living standards measured on this basis. So growth 
took off at different times in different countries. In Britain, this hockey stick growth began to kick in from roughly 1650, although you can see some growth had been occurring prior to that. But really, we trace back to around 1650 and then into the 1700s, the very rapid takeoff in economic growth measured on this per capita basis in Britain. In Italy, in comparison, growth was taking off from around 1800. In Japan, from a little after that, towards the end of the 1800s, from around 1870. And then in India and in China, the growth really kicks in from around the mid-1900s, and you can see how steeply growth is, is, uh, is increasing um, from that time. In some economies, substantial improvements in people's living standards did not occur until they gained independence from colonial rule or interference by European nations. And those are important features in thinking about the processes by which economic growth occurred across countries at different points in time. In part two of this mini video series for Unit 1, we'll briefly highlight some of the features of the technological revolution which is associated with this hockey stick growth and indeed with the capitalist revolution.